I'd like to invite you to another lecture in Environmental Science uh, 1401, and this is going to be Lecture 2 on um, Risk, Economics, Environmental Concerns, which is Chapter 3 in all editions of your book. Um, what we're going to be looking at today is uh, basically going to be how do we make decisions uh, based on risk and benefit and potential hazards uh, to the environment, to our personal health of everyday things, basically. We're going to look at how do we characterize risk. What are some of the environmental economics of uh, living society that we do based on our consumer wants and needs and how we perceive pollution, and also comparing economic and ecological uh, systems, plus using economic tools to address environmental issues and the economics of sustainable development. And we're going to cover uh, sustainable development uh, bits and pieces throughout this uh, um, semester. So when we start making decisions about how we use the earth in particular, and I mean in many ways as far as um, consumer items, uh, transportation, just, you know, basic needs, uh, um, we, we need to pay attention to whether we recognize it or not that most of our life's decisions involve some type of consideration that involves what we call a risk and a cost. So every benefit that we get from our from our living from our environmental footprint has a risk to it and we could either take a big risk or have a minimum risk but that's going to also have a cost i'm going to see how those two factors work together and look at various examples so um when we start looking at characterizing risk okay so when we look at the risk okay basically which is the end point of, of how we live. What we have to first of all look at before determining risk is what is the probability of a bad outcome of something happening. And probability just means um, what is my you know likelihood that I'm going to encounter a bad outcome. And there's various ways we'll see we can determine this. And then next is what are the consequences of a bad outcome? Because bad is going to be relative. And we start looking at environmental health, bad could be something that, or a consequence that takes a long time to harm us. It might take two years off our lives, or even six months off our lives, versus something that could cause acute or immediate harm. And this can, so we can look at long-term consequences, short-term consequences, not just to our health, but also to the environment. And this is what becomes a big issue with like looking at global climate change. There is a consequence, but it's a very long-term consequence that people don't see literally within their lifetime. And then what's the cost of it? Because guys, we pay a cost for everything. And we have what are called acceptable, co acceptable, uh, acceptable, sorry about that, acceptable cost, uh, costs. And that means basically what can we afford to have a safe environment to have a safe lifestyle, but also to have one that's convenient too. So we can set a cost for just about everything. And then all that leads into is the risk. And that means the probability that uh, a, a condition or action will lead to injury or damage or loss at a particular cost. So you're going to see a little a video a little later about how to interpret risk management charts. But, a lot, but um, everyday life is filled with what we call risk management, and you do it uh, all the time, regardless of whether you're aware of it. So we're going to see when we start looking at risk management. We're going to be categorizing risks. That means the risks of living, the risks of brushing your teeth, the risks of drinking water, the risks of driving, flying, or doing, or buying cell phones. Okay, how does that affect us? What are the risks of doing this, not only to our health, to the environment, but also to our, uh, our um, cost of living? So we can categorize things very simply according to low risk. And that just basically means we have this acceptable risk that we take for doing something. So let's say you're hanging a painting on a wall by yourself and you put a hammer in a wall. You're looking at a low risk situation. There's a risk that you can bang your thumb with a hammer or stick the nail in your hand or the paint that can fall on your foot. But we don't consider that very uh, um, catastrophic. And also, if we're careful, we can reduce that risk by reducing the probability of an accident by being careful. And then we have what we could identify as a medium risk. And that just means, man, this is something I have to think about. Like if I'm going to bungee jump, man, I can harm myself, but there's also protection in there that if everything is done right, 
it's very good I won't be injured. And then there's a high risk. And this might be like, oh boy, parachuting for the first time and you don't have an assist buddy. Everything has to be in the right condition. And even then, you can have a high risk of harming yourself. Under ideal conditions, you can hit a wind, you can land on telephone poles, and it can lead to significant high risk consequences. So when we de to determine this, this is called the risk matrix. And you're going to see a little later that what we do is we do a little statistics called probability or likelihood to say whether something that can be a risk is going to be near certain to happen to you or very remote. So again, it could be near certain. That means if you're going to jump off a cliff that's 20 feet, it's near certain something's going to happen to you. Now, if you're going to jump off a sidewalk, which is only like three inches high, it's very remote probability something's going to happen to you. Now, when we look at the consequence, this is something we have to be careful because consequences can have a real measurable aspect or an emotional aspect. And, and uh, uh, emotional aspects sometimes carry as much weight as the real aspect. And sometimes we call emotional perceived. So uh, a consequence can be negligible. That means I drink some water and it might have enough contaminants in it that it could take, let's say, a day off my life. Or it can taste bad and cause a little, you know, mental uh, stress in me. Or you could have water that is so dangerous, you could immediately vomit it up, get diarrhea, and die from a bacterial or, or other condition. So again, when we make these tables, and this is just looking at another one, when we make these tables, we're pretty consistent on how we do these. And we can come up with even various levels of risk based on cost. So we can add cost to a risk and say, I have a medium risk here, but I could accept this risk, you know, based on more cost. So there's various ways to do risk management. And as we go through this chapter, this will become more clear. And again, you'll see a couple of videos on this. So when we characterize risk, again, a very important principle is probability. And this is something that really we end up with a lot of misconceptions, preconceived notions about uh, the probability of something happening. So when I think about when I get in my car, when I was driving to the college to teach a class, um, I had a high probability of an accident occurring in that car, particularly in the traffic in this area. And I can see that all the time when I'm driving anywhere, particularly to the city of Houston or to the woodlands, there's a darn good probability I will get in a wreck and a darn good probability someone's doing something that can get into a collision with me. Now, when I fly in an airplane, I sit next to a lot of people that are very nervous, very concerned, they hear a little noise, and they start looking around, and luckily I've been flying a lot for many years, and also I was in pilot training myself. Um, I can explain to them, this is not a problem, this is typical. Usually sometimes I'll have fun and say, I've never heard that before in 40 years of flying, so whatever. So um, probability again is a mathematical statement, and insurance companies use this when figuring out your insurability with your own health. Like if you smoke, they have a mathematical measure of saying what your chance of getting respiratory disease is, and they can either not insure you because it could be a higher chance that you'll get sick and they don't want to take that option, or what they can do is charge you more because they know you're going to have more medical payments than someone like me who's never smoked and doesn't smoke. So again, probability comes in numbers, and we can look at it sometimes uh, in what we call epidemiological data, as we can say the occurrence of a particular illness in one in 10,000, one in 100,000, one in a million. And one example that your book uses is, for example, winning the lottery. If you play an average uh, national lottery ticket, depending on, of course, the people that buy it, is you could have one in a million chance of winning, which is very small or very improbable. So that's probability. Now, the next thing is the consequence. And consequences, too, can have a subjective aspect to it. That means we have a perceived aspect of a consequence, and we have uh, um, a realistic, measurable consequence. So, the out so a consequence is a bad outcome. And that bad outcome could be anywhere from minor to catastrophic. And as we look at outcomes, 
consequences vary from person to person. Like I might hit a hammer on my thumb and I've learned a very high tolerance for pain and I heal very quickly. So that might not be as bad a consequence for someone who, who let's say has hemophilia and, and can basically hemorrhage or bleed a lot from that injury. Some of us have a, a body chemistry that protects us from environmental pollutants so that the consequence is not as bad. So we find, particularly in human populations, is that females in general are more subject to environmental harm at certain levels than males are. So they have a higher consequence of environmental harm from lower amounts of pollution. And, and let's add to this ethnicity. So we could look at people from Asia and people from Africa they have a higher incidence of consequence too, based on the body's chemistry. Now, there's no absolutes about this. This is all based on, again, uh, statistical data. And then whenever we look at a consequence, we have to add the economic cause of that consequence. And when that comes up with what's called acceptable consequence, that adds to what's called acceptable risk. So that means how much am I going to pay for a consequence not to occur? So, for example, if I have drinking water that harms one in 10,000 people, and this is going to take a while to write 10,000 with a mouse. I need to use my touchpad. Um, I can look at that and say, you know, this involves no cost. So, therefore, I could live with one in 10,000 people getting mildly ill. Now, if people are dying, that might be another issue. Now, if I really want to be cautious, and you're going to learn about a principle called precautionary principle, I can say I want a safety margin, this is horrible, of one in 100,000 people getting ill. I want to be safer. I don't want as many people getting ill, and I'm going to put this much money into it. Then we can accept that, and sometimes people have to also be aware of this in their own decisions, like, for example, buying bottled water versus tap water. If you live within the Houston metropolitan area and use what's called the aquifer for water, you have very, very low probability and very low consequence of getting sick from the water. Now, if you have a well and you're in central Montgomery County, you have other issues with that. And more people get ill from that water than with us. So I can see me living within the Houston uh, um, uh, water district. It's not worth for me to buy bottled water because a bottle of water has about the same safety and maybe even worse. Now, if you live in uh, uh, northern rural Montgomery County, I might buy bottled water to eliminate contaminants uh, like arsenic, which could be in the water, uh, low levels of cyanide and other materials. Now, a very important principle for this class is something called perceived risk. And perceived risk, it's a hard thing to measure. A colleague of mine who's at Berkeley, uh, Andy, Dr. Andy Ernst, he used to be at uh, A&M Kingsville. Um, his research, he was an environmental air looking at, uh, I mean, environmental engineering, looking at air quality reduction and technologies for doing that. And he eventually started studying perceived risk as basically a change in his career. And he comes up with models of measuring perceived risk and how does that affect public policy and environmental engineering to produce a clean environment at an acceptable cost. So when we look at perceived risks and think about your own perceived risks, let's look at indoor air pollution. That means the air pollution inside a workplace, inside a house, inside a college building. So when we look at what is real, that means the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, the United Nations, a group called OSHA, Occupational Health and Safety Administration, their data shows that being indoors produces a high risk of environmental harm on us and on pets and on anything else in a household. And that includes anything, any enclosed building and anything particularly within an urban area. We find schools have very high levels of pollutants and so do office buildings and homes also. What's funny is people feel safe. We don't recognize these illnesses even when we do get sick and we have a very low perceived risk. So what does that do for us as a society when there's a very high real risk and low perceived risk? What happens is that it gives politicians the options of saying, let's not do much about it because nobody notices it. 
and you don't do much about it because you can't see putting money into it. But yet it could be causing long-term harm, and we know it does. There are Department of Energy uh, data that shows that we are exposed to a significant amount of DNA damage just from living in houses that are electrified. And this is known. We see an increase in mutation rate, increase in cancer rates just from living in an electrified environment. But we don't notice it. And anything that does pop up from it is not always linked to the, problem, to the issue of electrification. Let's look at safety of water. Same thing. We really have a low perception of the hazards of drinking water. And yet, in our environment, it is really a significant problem. We find a lot of issues with drinking water that the public doesn't recognize. And again, this is sometimes why we don't put a lot of effort or money into it, because people don't want to. They don't see it as being a problem. And when we look at these issues, we look at the cause of our water, we don't want to put much more money into it to think that we're going to get cleaner water, because we feel it's clean. Now, this is funny. When we look at ourselves on the job, and I worked in industry for, for five years, and I still consult in industry as far as industry safety and environmental compliance. And workers on the job, including myself, we felt safer than what we were. And I worked with hazardous lethal chemicals, lethal in very small doses. And what's really funny is I was cautious. I wore all my protective gear, but a lot of people I worked with did not, and they would get sloppy. And we'd find a lot of exposure incidents because they feel safe. Now, this is contrary. When we look at chemical accidents, I mean, I have to drive through Baytown a lot, through Lake City. I sometimes I have to drive through the Port of Corpus Christi. I travel to third world countries and to areas that have a lot of industry. And um, I feel somewhat safe because I come from that background. But if I'm with somebody, they get freaked out by the smell. They see these warning signs saying if there's a chemical spill. And this is very true for nuclear power plants. People that live near nuclear power plants have this high degree of caution right here but yet the risk and the pr is very low that means the probability of something happening is very low even if it's catastrophic we put protectors in there to prevent catastrophic things from occurring air pollution were equal because for the most part you can sense air pollution i can tell when air pollution is bad in my area because i get a headache i sometimes get a sore throat and the air just stinks so we have a pretty good grasp on that, and the same is true for oil spills, funny enough. You know, we live in a coastal area, and when we hear about an oil spill, our perception is it is as bad as it is. And that's kind of funny. So we, so these are two areas where we're probably equal. And this is where when we start looking at spending money, we do. And we start looking at, you know, paying attention to that issue. Here, we probably put more, you know, we put... A lot more into this than we need to sometimes when we look at chemical plant safety so companies are putting in sometimes too much more than what you get out of it so when we start looking at again this whole idea of safety what's a good case study in risk management and let's look at some data here World Health Organization they have found that about 1.2 billion cases of diarrheal disease each year result from in about 760,000 deaths of children under the age of five. So this is data that they have, particularly for third world countries. This is mostly looking at uh, 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 continents like Africa, parts of uh, Asia, when we look at parts of South America, particularly rural areas and whatever, uh, 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 India, Bangladesh, um, we see that this is true. We don't find this in the United States. So this becomes a big risk issue that we see the UN puts a lot of money into and also even starts a program called the Year of Water and looks at safe water as a human right. So this is, you know, a typical case study of how we look at something. So this is a real situation where water quality is a problem. So we are willing to put costs into this and people are willing to have their infrastructure changed to make better access to safe drinking water. And this it means in uh, putting in systems of toilets. This is the major problem is not having proper sanitation and also uh, a better collection of water so people are not con uh, collecting contaminated water. Unfortunately, the cost of dealing with water is very high. So high that people cannot afford 
to reduce this risk. So sometimes a risk remains high because uh, um, the, the, the culture cannot afford to get to the level that's acceptable. So again, one of the primary barriers when we start looking at drinking water and looking at issue is the cost of living. So back to this model of how do we make decisions about the risks we take in life and what is an acceptable risk, what is an unacceptable risk. We have to first look at the probability and this is mathematical. This is where science, math, engineering, everything comes in to make that decision us. That means your chance, your probability of encountering that consequence or gaining harm from that consequence. This is the intensity of the harm. So if you have a high probability of something occurring, but the consequence or harm to the environment or us is low, we tend not to worry about it. If the probability of risk of something is almost non-existent, but the consequence is high, again, we don't worry about it. If the consequence of something happening is real high probability and the consequence is high, we put a lot of money into avoiding it. Again, like how we deal with nuclear power, how we deal with uh, manufacturing. The economic part is equally important because this is where the concept of socially acceptable comes in. So do I accept that risk? And if I do accept it, what am I willing to pay for it? Am I willing to pay half my income? So people in developing nations, if people wanted to have risk-free water like ours, they could be paying two-thirds of their salary to do that. And already they can't afford to feed themselves to have adequate medical care. So they're going to put the money mostly into medical care or food necessities rather than water. So th this is the cruelty of environmental science. And this leads to environmental justice issues that I've seen over and over again. And I have to numb myself to sometimes as I go into third world countries. And what I try to do is find my best sustainable ways to reduce risk. The idea of sustainability in this picture is to find the cheapest way for people to accept something that gives them a very low risk life. Now, the whole idea of environmental economics, you can spend a whole lifetime studying this, but this is the basis again of our risk models. No matter what the issue is, protect our environment, protecting our health, you know, protecting squirrels, you know, whatever, rescuing an animal, whatever we do, there's an economic aspect to it, I'm sorry. And even if you volunteer to do something, there's human labor has a cost. Your own time doing something, like if you wanted to purify your own water, you have to spend time doing it. You have to put money into it. So there's an economics to everything, and that economics tends to really change our perception of what we want. Okay, and it also sometimes prohibits us from getting what we want. So when we start looking at our basic needs, this has a whole economic, oh, that's horrible, but that's okay. When we look at needs, that means these are things we have to have to survive, our basic needs, what we call low on the Maslow scale. That means we're willing to put in a higher economics versus something called a want. And a want is just a desire, like, you know, um, I want to have a newer, nicer car that doesn't have a cracked windshield and dented in fenders. Okay, but my basic need is just to have transportation because I need it here. So I will meet my need based on a certain cost. Now, if they double my salary, now I get into the want place and I can now get that little, um, you know, Mercedes Benz off road vehicle that sucks up gas like crazy. You know, so the economics is just as important as anything else. And if we perceive something is too expensive, we're not going to do it at the risk of our health. Now, um, another term we have to get into is part of living is taking resources from nature and using them for our survival. Any time we take a resource out of nature, we're harming nature in some way. We're competing with another creature's needs. We're competing with another human's needs. We're polluting. There's very few ways we can get around meeting our needs and using resources. And some resources, when we use, 
they don't come back. Some resources we could reuse, some we could recycle. We have to look at all of this from a cost benefit risk model. In some cases, recycling can cause harm and can be more expensive than taking a limiting resource out. So when economists look at us in the environment, we, we have to factor in how a resource impacts everything how a resource impacts our health, how it affects our cost of living. So resource is something that can be used at this moment that we have available to us. And resources in environmental science can be technology, capital technology. It means the technology that keeps our country growing, keeps us individually uh, um, wealthy, if you want to look, I mean, wealthy is relative. I mean, gives us a cost, a, 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 a livelihood that we like. There's also labor. As we can spend our whole life growing our food, our own food, doing whatever, and that has that is a resource in itself. It gives you no time for leisure, no time for anything else. And then there's land. Land is probably the biggest of the resources. What I mean by land is how do we use land for agriculture? How do we use it as a water resource? How do we mine out of it? How do we live on it? What do we build in it? We're going to get into urban planning. This is a very big issue. So everything has a cost with a consequence to it and a probability of it causing problems. Now, when we look at this concept called natural resource, this just means something that nature produces. It is not what we call synthetic. Natural resources just basically mean anything we get from the atmosphere, from our water, from the land, and from other organisms. And they can be categorized as renewable, or non-renewable. And, and guys, these terms are based on human lifespan. And you'll see why in a minute. So a renewable resource is something that is regenerated by natural processes at a rate that we can keep using it safely. And this is going to be based on lifestyle, that means your environmental footprint, uh, and also on population. And again, some examples of soil, vegetation, animals, atmosphere, and water. Now, non-removable just means that we can't replace this within a period of time that allows us to use this stuff from generation to generation to generation, and in some cases, it could be lost. Now, in some cases, a resource can be lost forever, and that means we can use it up totally and it will never come back. So like, for example, petrol. Petrol comes from uh, uh, fossil algae reserves. Coal comes from fossil plant and animal reserves, from swamps or from ocean. Petrol tends to be more oceanic, from salt water. Uh, coal tends to be more freshwater swamp. Those things took about 100 million to 200 million years to form. And they can still form again, but you're not going to tap out the current ones and expect to have stuff right away. It can take 100 million years for that to regenerate. So we have to think about how fast do we use it in order for there to be an adequate regeneration time. Trees we can chop down and estimate how many trees we're going to grow to replace that within the lifespan a tree takes to grow. So we can grow an adequate wood tree in 40 to 60 years and chop down a forest at a rate that allows that to grow back within a human lifespan. So again, we will look at non-renewable. That's like iron ore, fossil fuels, whatever. Now, we're clever enough that we can make synthetic non-renewables and make them somewhat renewable. Like, for example, petrol. Petrol is nothing magic. It's, the, it's basically the fats, the lipids from organisms. Okay, put under pressure over time, very slow, you know, specific chemical reactions. We can model that in the lab and we can create that 100 million year chemical reaction in hours. So we have the ability to take a non-renewable and make an alternative renewable out of it. So we can grow our own algae, grow crops solely for the purpose of replacing renewables. Okay, one of the worst terms we're going to deal with is this whole idea of what's a resource. Because you're going to hear politicians, environmental scientists, you know, whatever, uh, environmental groups talk about this idea of a reserve and a resource. And this chart kind of shows you that, but I'm going to add a little more, you know, detail to this. So when we use the term resource, 
a resource means what we see as the total amount of a material or primary energy flow that exists. Now, when I use the term material, I mean like the building blocks of our health and society. That means, you know, uh, protein and food, fats and food that build body. Uh, that means uh, um, soil that helps to grow crops, fertilizer that helps to grow crops. Um, it means soil available for us to live on, to build buildings. I mean, sand to build, to make cement. When I look at energy, that means things like uh, carbohydrate content of food that gives me energy to run my body. It means petrol that helps us to run our society. So when we talk about resources, resources could be looking at a material thing or an energy thing. And sometimes these even conflict. Now, so the term resource means everything that is out there and even stuff we may not know about. Now, when we use the term reserve, and this is sometimes misunderstood by politicians. A reserve is a material. That means some type of object that we use as a material, like, for example, uh, um, you know, sand for cement or petrol for burning energy. Okay. We can call that a deposit sometimes. Okay. We know these exist with a reasonable level of certainty. We know that are there. So reserve is something that we know is there. That means a resource we know is there. Now, this is kind of a lie in a way, because really what it means is that we can get at it easily and that the cost is acceptable. So a reserve, what it really means is we know it's there. We're sure it's there. We can get at it and it's cheap compared to what we consider our cost of living. Now, the concept of resource is a little bigger. Resource, we can be sure it's there or we can think it's there. This is what petrol companies do. They go about, you know, speculating based on data, you know, sometimes loose data, is whether there's a petrol reserve somewhere. And now I say reserve, that means they're trying to confirm it's a reserve, but where there's a petrol resource out there for real. So, they, and there's a case in point uh, of a situation in now with being on what's called the Advisory Council for the Flower Gardens Banks National Marine Sanctuary. We're in charge of protecting a, co uh, a series of coral reefs in the Gulf of Mexico. And we have to preserve the reef, that means preserve the animals, knowing that there are reserves and resources out there. One of the reserves is fish. Okay. And, and just to let you know that the Gulf of Mexico, its health is very important for literally 60 to 70 percent of the world's fisheries. Fish come from all over the world to feed in there uh, uh, um, because of the rich coral reefs. And we know that animals migrate in and out to literally everywhere and use it as a source of food. It's also a source of oxygen and other things. It's a source of commerce for ourselves, for fish. And we also know that there's petrol out there, oil. So we have to balance this. So when we look at preserving the Gulf of Mexico, we have to pay attention that there's resources out there. And one is a good reserve of fisheries, and one is a known reserve of oil that we can both use cheaply. Because that's an important concept, too, we'll talk about in a minute. So we had an, a petrol person come up and say, yes, we have our reserves, and we would like the permission to keep using our reserves at the consequence of it calming harm to the, to the corals and even to the fish. So we look as we balance this and we say, okay, you know what there, it's cost effective, you can use it, but let's please try to reduce the impact, environmental impact on the corals, on the fish, because this affects livelihood for people if you affect the fish. Now, they also tell us that we think if we would explore this properly, we can find another million gallons. And this happened over the coast of Brazil. Coast of Brazil, some researchers confirmed a resource. They found that there was like another 10 year supply of oil for literally the world underneath uh, um, uh, 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 a Lillian equivalent Gulf off the sea uh, off the, uh, of Brazil. And they want to they want to protect it so that when the cost gets affordable to drill it out and they get the better technology to drill it out, they want to make sure that it doesn't compete with anything else. And we know that off the coast of Brazil, we also have protected waters there in areas just like the Gulf 
that we have a lot of fishing, we have a, a, you know, a lot of other things going on there, that we don't want to destroy it. So I am not sure the stuff is out there. Do we already start saying we should be able to drill there without knowing something's there? And what if it's so expensive we can't drill it, it's not worth it? Why leave that area open to damage? So these are how these decisions are made. Now, to define a reserve also, there's an idea of cost and ease. So there's cost and ease. So really when we define a reserve, what we're saying is that we have this air, a resource that we're sure is there again, and it has the right cost, and that's horrible, but I like it. Okay, the right cost and the right ease to get it out. And guys, as technology grows, as technology gets cheaper, reserves tend to go on the increase when it makes resources more attainable. So I know this sounds a little confusing, but a reserve means something that's there and waiting for us. It doesn't mean we're just storing it. It means it's there, and sometimes we do store it, like in Alaska. We store oil in a place we know we can get out of the ground easily, and it's cheap enough to do. And the same is true for diamonds and everything else up in Alaska, a lot of minerals. But there are some minerals up there that are a resource. We think they're there, or we know they're there, but they're inaccessible, or the cost to get them out is not worth the, the current market value. Now, something that ropes into the whole picture of economics and using of resources and reserves is this whole idea of supply and demand. And this is just economics 101. Okay, we have to live with a footprint in which we have to closely balance supply, particularly when we start talking about natural resources and particularly natural reserves. I mean, stuff we have access to particularly is that are we going to maintain that as a reserve? Are we going to use it at a rate where the supply can satisfy our needs but still give us something from generation to generation? Okay, demand basically is how fast we're using something, and that's about it. And just like in any aspect in the environmental sciences, we see this as a cost that comes along not with just risk but also with supply and demand. And in environmental science, the best way to make sure that something does not dwindle is to use cost as a way to reduce demand. And it sounds kind of sad, but if we want to avoid people having using up reserves and have to then dig into maybe unknown resources or have to rely on a resource, that means we have to spend more money to get out of the ground, that's going to increase price. So this is your simple economic model. And we see this particularly in agriculture. To protect agriculture, we use this whole idea of when the demand is high and the supply is low, we elevate prices, and that prevents farms from doing more environmental damage and meeting a demand that might be crazy sometimes and unnecessary. In our country, we tend to eat much more food and waste much more food than other countries. So we have a fake demand in a way. And one way we control that fake demand is to, I hate to say this, reduce the supply. And you can't ration food to us. So what we'll do is make certain food so expensive that we're less likely to buy it and we'll, or we'll use it less. So when we look at supply and demand, um, you know, it, it's not just cost that drives supply and demand. Some factors in the environment can, of course, reduce the supply, and then again, we have to still have a disincentive for the demand. So when we start looking at particularly agriculture or, or even forest resources or petrol, when literally something happens that we can't harvest that, when we can't get it out of the ground, we can't grow it, like for example in farming, if, um, if there's a weather that destroys crops, that reduces supply. And of course, that's, the demand can outstrip the supply. Again, we got to adjust it with cost. But it's not just you know, messing around with money that creates supply and demand. It has to do with many factors. Again, the cost of land and farming could affect, again, the supply. So for example, where my uh, mother retired to in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, okay, she lives near a lot of Amish farms. And the cost of uh, uh, land has gone up so much, they can't 
afford to sell their crops anymore at a profit. They have to raise the price of their crops, and it becomes a disincentive for people to the point where they don't want to buy it, even though it's like organic and stuff like that. So they're they're you know they're seeing the cost. They they have to raise the cost of their crop only because it's costing them more. But again, the demand could diminish to the point where the crop gets so expensive, people would just rather buy other stuff. And we start looking at uh, even the cost of running a farm. As petrol goes up, the cost of fertilizer goes up, the demand for fertilizer, it, you know, goes up, and it, you know, that all increases the cost of farming. So again, there are many things that could affect supply in a world of consistent demand that we have to somehow find a disincentive for the demand. So when we start looking at resource usage and the consequences of it, how do we assign value to a natural resource? That means when we look at a resource, what, you know, how do we adjust this cost and benefit? How do we look at it as a need or a want? And how do we even make use of it? So when we assign value, okay, particularly in cost, let's say, if a natural resource has always been rare or expensive, of course, we add a cost to that. And in some cases, we refuse to use it. Okay, if the supply is very large and the demand is low, we don't add value to that much resource and it gets to sit around. And guys, at one time, water was this way. Before we developed what we are, water was very abundant. The demand was mostly for agriculture. Very few people even showered. There was very little industry to use that water. And we perceived it as something that we could even waste. and something that was almost just not to worry about, its own quality. We didn't worry about it. As, as populations grew, as factories started using water and larger operations, whatever, the water supply is now scarce to the point where it's a, commodity, a valuable commodity. And we see it being rationed. We see it getting very high cost sometimes, including our area. Okay, and if something is renewable, we have this tendency to think it will always be there. We forget that our demand can outstrip it, and we tend to overexploit it. So value systems of how we perceive a resource from historical specters and even from current perspectives could really affect you know, this whole supply, demand, and cost of an issue. Now, another difficult concept for me to deal with, and this is one I have trouble grappling with, is something called an ecosystem service. And basically, an ecosystem is an environment that contains, you know, abiotic, biotic factors that we use as a resource and contains materials that are in reserve for us. So let's just pick, like, let's say a forest that's nearby. We could use that forest for trees. We could use it for um, mining minerals. We can chop it down and use it for a farm. We can chop it down and build it into a house. We could use it to, um, um, you know, drill oil in whatever when, uh, that's what we sometimes call a tangible resource that gives us economic wealth the way our society works a development society and a society that tends to be more anthropocentric we see nature economically as an, something to improve our economic wealth and we have no issue whatever with removing that ecosystem or exploiting it. Now, a concept that many environmental scientists prescribe to, and it's a very difficult one for me to think about and to try to justify, particularly to politicians, to, to, uh, to the corporate world, is that sometimes an ecosystem has a value we don't see. And sometimes its absence can cause a harm that, is, that we want to avoid. And this is really what's called a, a, a true inherent ecosystem service. When most people think of ecosystem service, that means if that environment is gone, what did it really do to us that we're now going to miss and can have economic impact and health impacts on us and environmental impacts in general? So, for example, in let's say a field of flowers, what we would call a meadow, those flowers might not have direct economic value to us that we can see. So we say, man, let's put a farm here. 
let's make use of this. Let's grow trees and plant trees for wood or, or for paper. We might not know that that those flowers are a home for honeybees, natural honeybees that po that pollinate, you know, literally billions of dollars worth of crop a year. That's a problem for the people that sell these products, that sell fruits and any vegetables and honey and stuff like that, because they don't want to have to pay to bring pollinators in, or they don't want to have to hand pollinate. That gets expensive. So by not by by not having that environment. Their business can go under or it makes life very expensive. In our situation, something very tangible was we uh, in Houston, you know, we just had Harvey. We had incredible flooding, not just due to rainfall, but also due to the fact that we don't recognize our wetlands, our wet areas and our forested areas as having an ecosystem service. Forests and wetlands absorb water. They prevent rain runoff. Trees can remove thousands of gallons of of water, you know, in a day per tree to dry up an area. And we've removed probably in some areas 75% of the ground cover trees and 75% of the wetlands to the point when there is a rainfall, flooding is going to occur. The flooding is going to move into areas and pocket and it's not going to be evaporated and build up. It's not going to go away quickly either. So this, so when we start looking at ecosystem services, we got to pay attention to the biology. What is that ecosystem doing? What is it? Gonna, what's going to be its absence? And are we willing to live with its absence? And this is kind of bad about flooding. When flooding goes away, people forget about it, and we don't want to put money up front, or we don't want to protect the land that we need to prevent it. And that's sad that we do that. But, but you're going to have an activity a little later when we cover ecosystems and biomes of how do you find the inherent, the natural worth of an ecosystem to the point where we want it there and not for a tangible resource. And we start looking at resources too again, guys, and what's tangible. Remember, there's a resource of need. What do we need to survive in a resource of want, meaning what toys do we want to have as a society? Text us. So, when we use an environment, one of the costs or the risks of doing business is the fact of everything we do causes pollution. Eating causes pollution. You pee and poop. We have to do something with it. Most of you don't store it in your house. Okay. When we drive our car, it causes pollution in many ways in the whole uh, um, uh, uh, obtaining of petrol, the processing of petrol, the use in your car the disposal of oils in your car. So there's all sorts of factors and things related to pollution. Households produce a lot of pollution, probably more so than, than cars. Okay, industry produces pollution, but that's industry is not for the sake of producing pollution, but for the fact that we're, it's helping us with our lifestyles. So what we have to look at as a society is what's the cost financially and also emotionally, personally, of using the environment. What is the cost of losing the environment? Okay. And what is the cost of not using it? And what is the cost of the consequent pollution? So everything we do, the environment is going to suffer in some way. And even if we use what's called sustainable measures, that means we try to re re replace the environment, it's always not going to be the same. It may be the same for us as far as a resource, but maybe not for the same for the environment itself. Because once disturbance occurs, it's very difficult to replicate the original condition. So as a society, we really got to think about our footprint, our lifestyle, and whether we're living in a world of needs or a world of wants. 80% of the world is living in the world of needs. And that means they're trying to do basic survival with the knowledge that they are polluting. And yes, they can't avoid pollution because they can't give up their basic needs. And they live with the cost of pollution, the health costs, and also maybe the cost of cleaning up. I ran into this in Bangladesh with tanneries industry. That means the making of leather. And it's not even for their countries to export. So they need the industry of tanning leather, tanning other materials, and the tanning materials are poisoning them. And I know this. We have data on it. Been there, studied this problem, and we're trying to find a way that we can keep the industries going 
and reduce the pollution because the industries don't really harvest from the environment. It's using cattle and, and other materials that are normally harvested. Okay, so it's not that it's, I mean, it is damaging the environment as far as pollution. So how do we keep these people in their economy? And why is uh, India and particularly Bangladesh have such a good tanning market? Because labor is inexpensive, but also the materials are expensive, and they don't have environmental policy that causes them to uh, remediate pollution. So if we want to clean this up, we can't add to the cost of tanning. We can't, you know, um, have a lot of money go into remediating pollution. So we're working with the local scientists to come up with inexpensive ways to either change the tanning process and make it safer or clean up the environment before or after the pollution occurs. There are ways of doing this. Okay. All we can do is build med better medical facilities and treat the people. But again, that then adds a cost to the person themselves or to the society overall. Because someone has to pay for health care. So these are all big, ugly issues that we deal with. And in a country like ours, guys, we have unreasonably high costs we pay for allowing to pollution to occur or remediating pollution. This is not true in other countries. So when I meet with other countries, I can't go in with an American attitude. And we can't take this attitude when we look at how the other countries deal with their standard of living. I know in, 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 when I was in um, uh, uh, Japan, England, Manila, uh, Beijing, I dealt with air pollution level that was, I consider unacceptable here. But again, the difficulty and the cost of treating it is not their priority. There are other things they have to pay attention to as far as their lifestyles, to make that a primary cause. Now, when people are dying on the streets, yes, but it makes, uh, but they still look at clever, what we call sustainable, inexpensive ways to deal with it. So, when we get into environmental cost, okay, we could, <laughs> this sounds kind of funny, but sometimes what we do is we can defer a cost. That means we as a society chose to ignore the cost of an environmental damage because it gives us so much good. So we dam a river. We chop down a forest to build a farm. We kind of almost discount the idea of the environmental impact and the health impact on that for the benefit that we get. And unfortunately, sometimes this happens a lot in developing countries where they'll chop down incredible amounts of rainforests, knowing it's going to have a long-term effect on weather, on other things, but yet they need that food, particularly if it's going to be a commodity that they export, and that's their only income. See this in Hawaii, even. See it in Puerto Rico. Okay. Then there's this concept called external cost. And that means as we do something, and people are getting a benefit from it, Sometimes we don't see what's called external costs. That means we see harm to people that are not benefiting from it. So, for example, if we put a factory in a lower income area that produces products, let's say expensive cars, that those people are not going to buy. So those people are getting polluted by it. They might get jobs, but maybe not. But let's say they don't get jobs because the jobs require an education or skill level they don't have. So what happens is that their area has this factory that's not benefiting them whatsoever, and they get the pollution from it. They don't benefit anyway economically, and they do get uh, environmental harm and public health issues from it. So these are called external costs. And this is what happens to us when we import things. We do harm to other people that don't get the benefit of it except a few bucks. And in most cases, the poor people are not getting it. The people that own the companies, the government is getting the benefit. The poor might get a little, but not worth the, the environmental damage they have or the, uh, the pollution that they get from it, the, uh, the public health harm. So these are all, again, ways we deal with issues in the environment. This is where ethical systems come in to risk models. So I know I'm giving you a lot, but we're going to see a couple of videos that kind of make a little more sense of this. So now, the whole idea of cost and benefit. What am I willing to pay in money, in health, in pollution, in other people being harmed, in environmental loss, 
for the benefits I derive. And the problem with benefits is this. There's the benefits that are a need and the benefits that are a want. And we have to look at ourselves and think, for the stuff that I want, is it worth doing? I'm serious, because this is where we start seeing, you know, a lot of environmental damage, a lot of pollution occurring that is probably not necessary. Are we willing to live as a society that lives in a status quo? Were we willing to give up cell phones? Are we willing to give up having all the electronic devices because of the harm they cause? I mean, every day I turn around, there's a new electronic device. I have a watch that links to my phone, and now I can have a tablet that also becomes a bigger version of my phone. And I can have this, I can have that, I can have a Fitbit that also does something for me, and on and on. And you know what? Really, I could use two cell phones, one that I use for people who don't really want calling me or for the junk and others for whatever. So we could add on and on to these wants that are not really fulfilling a basic need. So um, when we look at cost-benefit analysis, our government, particularly when it comes to the environment, what's called NEPA, the National Environmental uh, Policy Act, which is run by the uh, Environmental Protection Agency. So we have this thing called NEPA, which starts to mandate the impacts of everything we do on the environment and tries to come up with a rational model of if you want something, if you want to produce pollution, if you want to mine this way, if you're going to cause harm to people as a result of this activity, harm to the environment, this is the cost of it. And we could even look at the economic cost of doing it. We can then derive better what the benefit of it is. Is it worth the benefit? If we're getting $3 a benefit from $100 worth of harm, that is not good. And this is particularly true with the Clean Water Act. Guys, if it wasn't for the Clean Water Act, you would be drinking water that was totally undrinkable. So what we decided to do was reduce certain activities and a lot of cost to using water to make sure it is clean enough that you don't have a public health issue in this country. We don't have hundreds of thousands of people getting sick and tens of thousands of people in this country dying from water. We feel what we pay for water, that means the taxes to clean it up, the money it costs goes into products to make sure that water is clean before it gets out into the environment from being used to make a product to, and to also reduce the amount of water it goes into making products, your own sewage water, blah, 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 and making sure that water is clean. That is worth it for us to have very few deaths and very few illnesses. We don't want to be in a situation in developing countries where people get sick from water all the time, we're paying high medical bills, and a lot of children are dying. So cost-benefit analyses vary a lot but we do have ways of making it rational and of course sometimes we can ignore a cost sometimes we could defer it again we can look at it uh, we could value it as a, a want that we have to have or make available to society so again cost benefit analysis is not a perfect thing and many environmentalists argue that the biggest part of a cost-benefit analysis is the economic. And that what we do is we don't think about other factors. And this is where your perception of the environment comes in. There are other non-economic things. And I tend to be, funny enough, um, somewhat leaning towards a pragmatism that says, yeah, we have to look at the economics. Because that's the only way I can justify the politicians and to the public and to industry people of what we're doing. And why do we preserve the environment? Preserve means protect forever. Why do we conserve the environment? It means that we use it at a steady low pace and make sure that it's renewable. So guys, some people believe, the aestheticists believe that there's a natural beauty. I mean, seriously, there's a natural beauty to the environment. There's a quiet to it. There's something psychologically important on it. And science has even had this principle called biophila, that we're lovers of nature. And we have surveys that show when people move into an area, they want nature. They want green belts. They want stuff, even in a big city. They want that thing, even if it's a plant on their patio. They value it in a way that has no economic value. And some people pay a hell of a lot of, of money for yards, and trees and other stuff, more so than they would for food. They wouldn't even second guess it. 
we value land for recreation, okay? I kayak, sometimes reluctantly, okay? And I sp spend a lot of money on it, probably more than I need to. And I really, it's a want for me. It's not a need. I don't kayak so I can hunt for fish and, you know, feed the family. So I value recreation. I love hiking. I love glacier, glacier climbing, except the part where I can fall off and die. Okay, so I see that there, that recreation is important, and so does our government. They value it and keep a, that recreation is a resource in itself and prevents other resources from being taken out of it and throws it, you know, basically reserves we know are in there out the window into being an unattainable resource. Um, for the most part, you know, nature to us is kind of like a cleanliness. Okay, we, you know, we see it as unspoiled. But again, these are non-economic things. And we have to learn society of how do we add value to that. And some people have actually added economic value to recreation. A colleague of mine, she started this whole big ecotourism movement where she said, I can make more money out of this river than you developing the river for water used to pollute or drink out of. So we got to preserve this water so people want to kayak on it, so people want to bird watch on it, because if we pollute the water, the birds go away. And she was very successful out of buying these lands that they kept clean so birds can land in it, and bird watchers come in and spend a heck of a lot of money, stay at hotels, they come and use our stores and restaurants and whatever, and they bring in an economic impact that's incredible. So sometimes we can look at the beauty of something and say, yeah, there is an economic input for it. So when we start looking at economics, when we start looking at ecological systems, how do we use resource? Is we have to think about time frames. We tend to think in human lifespans. We only see resources in our own lifespans. Politicians see this in political uh, 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 election spans. Governments sometimes make five-year plans, 10-year plans, but we all have a time frame of what we're willing to pay, what are we willing accepting as harm, and what's the cost of something over time. We are sometimes stuck with our units of measures. What are acceptable measures, particularly for risk? Is one out of a thousand being harmed? Okay. Is one out of ten thousand? Is one out of a hundred thousand? Is one out of a million? And how do we measure risk? How do we measure, I mean, low, medium, high? This is kind of crazy. But how do we add a number to it that makes it really more applicable to coming up? What are we willing to pay to do for it? We have a complexity of value systems. A complexity of an environment that we have one ecosystem that can provide us with 15 different resources that all, if we harvested one or didn't or use that ecosystem for its own ecosystem service that can compete with itself. And then there's location. Guys, the, where a resource is located makes a big difference. And where we build landfills, where we put a farm, this all affects the value and the cost benefit and the risk assessment of how we do stuff. So I'm going to end this lecture with a little about what we call life cycle analysis. So when we start looking at resources and we start looking at this whole idea of sustainability, meaning how do we start using resources for the future? How do we reduce the risk of our lifestyles? Is there's a concept called life cycle analysis and extended product responsibility. That means when we do something, and that includes like producing a crop, producing a cell phone, uh, producing electricity, um, how we make cars, we have to take into account what's called the life cycle. That means how do I use this resource uh, 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 over a period of time? What do I do with the product? Is there other ways to do this? What's the cost of each step? So wh when we look at life cycle, Okay, what, we're gonna, uh, uh, what we have to think about is everything involved in the production of that product. That means what raw materials, what energy is coming out of it, is it renewable or non-renewable? Are we building an item that could be reused or used forever? When I start looking at cars, my gosh, I mean, you know, cars at one time were designed for a very long product life cycle, but they weren't really reusable. 
you just threw them out. There wasn't really much you can do with them. Now, I don't think cars really last too long, like at least not the ones I own, and they're not meant for a lot of long-term use, but they are highly recyclable today. Okay, when you look at disposal, again, uh, with cell phones, cell phones in particular are very difficult to recycle, to reuse, there's a lot of toxic materials, and we tend to throw them out. A lot of stuff we tend to throw out. And this is sometimes even built into a product with what's the habits of a person. Are people more likely to take this product and throw it out or keep it or reuse it or recycle it? And cell phones are very highly reusable. We take them and ship them to other places where they get refurbished. We don't have to throw them out. And they're dangerous to recycle, to be honest with you, and very difficult. But we have places that are willing to do that. Unfortunately, right now, third world countries, which sometimes don't do the, the, have the best environmental impact on it. And also when we look at a product, we kind of think about its useful life as far as a person's perspective. Okay, you know, some items we buy and we get rid of right away, we never use it again. Other items we use forever. Okay, other items we use in a way that they break easily, easily others not. So when we start looking at how we build society, and again, that includes everything from houses to cell phones to, uh, to cars. How do we identify changes that we can make in the product design, its usage, and how do we educate the public on how to reduce the environmental resources and the environmental impact? So when you think of life cycle analysis, think about the overall uh, uh, environmental impact of a product through its lifespan. That means from the minute it's made to the minute it's died and someone throws it out. And, that in, and, and making a product more useful can mean we make it with less material, safer materials, we can make it so that it lasts longer, we can make it that it's easy to recycle or easy to reuse. And, and, and this, uh, um, when we start looking at product life cycle, again, this, this a lot of works into the, in the economics of sustainable development. So I'm going to dwell, like your book does, on this idea of sustainability and sustainable development. Sustainable development is not a new idea. It's how people lived in ancient times before societies became so large that we literally developed into these, what I'm gonna call crazy interactive big urban areas where we've lost our sustainable nature. People don't see the, the, the way we really use resources. So what sustainability basically means, how do we live for the future to ensure that our cost of living our lifestyle, our access to resources is going to be the same from generation to generation, or even how do we moderate it and cap it off so that the future never sees the running out of resources. This is an incredibly idealistic model that, you know, works in some cultures, doesn't work in other cultures. And it, 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 it's difficult to do globally. This whole idea of sustainability. Most people that look at sustainability look at it from a village model. And that we need to go back to this village model of, of villages that meet their own needs. And this is very, but, but when we, it's hard to backtrack to that point. So when we hear about sustainable development, it's sometimes called green growth, smart growth, whatever. There's various terms for it. But it basically just looks at, as our population grows, do we want it to keep growing? And if we're going to be sustainable at that point, how do we manage resources that allow population growth without running out of stuff and without polluting the environment to the point that we can't live it? Or do we tap our growth before we reach what's called this 2050 scenario? That means a scenario where for what we think are the reserves and resources of this world, humans will be at the point where we think every resource out there might be equal to the population. And if our population grows any bigger, there's nothing out there that can help us aside from importing stuff from other planets. So by 2050, if our population is not stabilized, we're gonna reach the point where we better be sustainable 
or we're going to see horrible things. We're going to see resources come to an end. We're going to see pollution reach a, a, a point where it's going to be worse than it was before we had the Environmental Protection Agency. So these are all things to think about. And sustainability is the one principle that tries to address this issue. So when we look at the characteristics of sustainability, if we're going to have a growing population, we better start thinking about renewability, better ways of dealing with making renewable products, and slowing down those things that are not renewable, our use of those things. How do we come up with substitution? Like if we're going to keep using petrol, we don't want to get away from petrol. We're going to have to find substitutes that are renewable for that and substitutes that have less environmental impact, like some of the new biofuels are today. Okay, we're going to have to make institutional commitments. That means that, man, we better have governments that support this. We have to have social structures that support this. And that means right down to your community. Are we going to value sustainability? We have to be adaptable. That means we always have to assess our sustainable development and not on a five-year plan, which, but maybe annually. We have to have real measures that say, is sustainability working? Is it reducing pollution? Is it increasing public health? Is the cost of living being manageable? Or, or environments being protected? And stuff like this. And there has to be an incredible interdependence on each other that we all have to learn to share and we all have to learn to meet a middle ground. And guys, if some people are going to have more resources, are other people willing to sell it to them? A, a colleague of mine from years ago, John Posey, envisioned this model where he took the whole earth and gave every person on a piece of earth a monetary share. That means he gave them all a piece of the world and every part one had access to that equal piece of, uh, piece of the world. And so everyone got an equal share, whoever was born, we all shared it. And his idea of that, if we had people being born and we all started sharing a little piece of the earth and owned it and put it in a bank called the Global Bank, this bank was like a Bitcoin type thing. People could either hold on to their shares and keep it to live the way they want. They could spend all their shares at a great rate and buy some from others and live a great life. Others can sell their shares and live at a minimum cost. So if you want to have people that can live sustainable and those that not, you can have some that want to live below the sustainability, meaning that they're giving up resources that was fair. He also believed that we had to peak our population for this too, or have a slow enough growth that we can, we can maintain this. So this is difficult to do. There were a lot of ideology that goes into this that is not realistic in a society like ours and in many countries. So, when we, again, your book focuses on this idea of sustainability. Okay, how do we live, not, and yes, in harmony with the environment, but also in harmony with ourselves, and how do we grow as a society that allows technological change without doing too much damage to the environment and without having too much of a cost that people are suffering. Because one thing sustainability takes into account too is everybody lives at the lifestyle that they feel they need to. And we're not talking about wants, we're talking about needs. If people buy want wants, then they have to do something to get that. And that means cooperating again with other people to allow them to have that. But people, we have to have some equity. That means interdependence here, where everybody is living at a lifestyle that is not causing them to die early, that's not causing their children to die sooner with when we have the technology and resources available to help them. So if we're going to keep hundreds of thousands of children from dying or getting ill from water, we're going to have to share some of our technology at a cost to us to do this. But how are we going to do this in a way that is sustainable for us and keeps our cost of living reasonable, but also helps these people. And what are they going to do to also contribute to our lifestyle too, and our likelihood? So again, very difficult decisions. And sustainability can be realistic. It's just right now we're stuck in these uh, a, a lot of um, uh, um, environmental ethics thinking that does not allow it. So I know again this was another long lecture. 
But if you have any questions, please send me an email or leave me a voicemail because that does roll over to my phone. Email I probably prefer. Um, uh, you have access to the PowerPoint. I also assigned you a couple of assignments that reinforce this, these concepts. Thank you.